My name is Mike Sendoma, and I am the Program Director at Sports Medicine Concepts. I'm also the host of the Sports Emergency Care White Paper Sessions. Um, and again, my objective here today is to provide a pragmatic approach. That pragmatic approach is based on observations, many of the observations that come in uh, the form of our In Two Minutes or Less program. So what have we learned over the last summer of teaching the In Two Minutes or Less program? What observations can we make and what pragmatic uh, decisions can we make based on really the, the expert opinion of hundreds of uh, sports emergency care personnel um, that we've had the luxury of working with and the opportunity to provide training for over the summer. So the observations that we've seen in, in that respect uh, as well as the expert opinion from a multitude of multidisciplined group of sports medicine professionals including paramedics, trauma physicians, athletic trainers, uh, all the way across the board, anyone involved in the sports emergency care spectrum uh, we try to provide a little bit of perspective with respect to their expert opinion on some of these questions. Um, so I, I bring to you a little bit of, of, of that knowledge base from the In Two Minutes or Less program and also from the perspective of an athletic trainer. Uh, and I very, very much practice everything that I preach and talk about in these sessions um, as an athletic trainer for Livonia Central School District here in uh, Rochester, the Rochester, New York area. So again, I'll be able to provide a little bit of spec uh, perspective from the high school athletic training um, component of, of this. Uh, your CEUs are only awarded for live participation in the event, so you guys are all set. Uh, this is a recorded session, so you, it'll be available uh, on our Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel, but when you view it online, uh, there are no uh, CEUs associated with that. So um, those of you that are participating live, you're all set. You will receive a CEU certificate, usually within about 24 hours, maybe 48 hours after completion of the program, uh, when you guys complete the program evaluation, okay? Recorded session links will come up uh, and you'll get a, a, a link to that in a follow-up email as well. And don't forget that we offer informational Friday series on our YouTube channel, which is really turning out to be a pretty neat series. So I want to invite you to that. That's a totally free service that we offer through our YouTube channel uh, where we do various reviews, kind of short 15, maybe 30 minute reviews of products that, um, that are on the market that could possibly complicate or enhance our ability to provide sports emergency care in the pre-hospital care setting. So for example, uh, we recently did one last month on the Riddell Speed Flex football helmet. That turned out really good. I think I think uh, I think so anyway. And it seems to have gotten some pretty good comments. Um, we're also finishing up one that took us a little bit longer than we thought it was going to on the uh, scoop stretcher protocol. We're going to be talking a little bit about that, and you'll see some images from uh, from that as well, uh, talking about the scoop stretcher protocol today. But that one goes over as, as we'll talk about some of the complications of the scoop stretcher protocol. You'll see that that review that we did actually documents uh, a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about. So uh, keep that in mind too. You can always go to our website at sportsmedicineconcepts.com and that's where you can find links to our social media outlets including Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube where you can follow us in any one of those social medias. And that's where we kind of communicate information and don't worry. One thing I, I am, am very strict about is we do not send tweets out, just random tweets, because we feel like we need to keep in touch. Um, if, if we don't have anything that's important to you as an athletic trainer, as a sports medicine professional, something that can help you later on that day, then we don't tweet it out. So uh, it's only things that are relevant to us as sports healthcare professionals and our ability to communicate and provide uh, enhanced care in the pre-hospital setting that um, that, that's the only information that you're going to get from us. Okay, so with that, I want to turn to our topic at hand today, which is current trends and transfer protocols. And I call this wood chipping the long spine board because it seems like that's the trend, that everybody wants to get rid of the spine boards. And, and, and some, uh, some EMS crews aren't even carrying the long spine board on, on, their, on their ambulances anymore. I've, I've heard that rumor. Uh, here locally that's not the case, but certainly our protocols here have changed as well. Um, so there is a very big movement 
away from using the long spine board. So today what our primary objectives are will be to provide an overview of alternatives to the long spine board. So if, there, if the literature is moving away from a long spine board, what is the literature suggesting that we move to? Uh, and then what I wanted to do is I wanted to evaluate the application of these alternatives to the athletic environment. Because um, as you'll see, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of going to make a, a little bit of an argument for maybe the long spine board is still very relevant. Uh, in the athletic environment. And we'll see. Those are decisions you can make and, and we'll just lay that out for you. Uh, and then I want, at the end of the program, I want to suggest an evidence-based transfer protocol that can be very specific to athletics. So let's, let, let's move right into it and see if, if we can't meet those objectives here today. And certainly, a lot of what we're going to be talking about is based on pseudoscience. In other words, we're not going to be able to look directly at the evidence, peer-reviewed literature, peer-reviewed evidence, to say that one protocol is better than the other. It's just not possible to do that. It's the same anecdotal evidence, the same expert opinion, and the same observational information that is driving the trend away from long spine boards um, that will also drive our discussion here today. Okay, so. Even science used to argue against the long spine board is based on this level or, uh, of science, or what we refer to as pseudoscience. It's very hard, if not impossible, to test these protocols using traditional scientific strategies that we're all used to. Um, and then, therefore, it's only through observation and epidemiological evidence that we're going to be able to evaluate these uh, as time goes on. So the long, sp long, long spine boarding dogma originally uh, ha has progressed because the long spine board was originally designed to remove people from a vehicle or to move a person to an EMS gurney. And after a time, people were simply kept on the long spine board. So rather than just bringing them out of the car, taking them off the long spine board and transferring to the emergency department, they were just left on the long spine board. There was no evidence to support the need to do this. More often than, le than not, it was probably just easier to leave them on the long spine board. And as we'll see in our discussion here today, that's certainly still the case. Uh, it's certainly easier to leave them on the long spine board than it is to remove someone from the long spine board, especially an equipment-laden athlete. Um, so we'll, we'll, see, we'll see that as we talk today. So, over the course of years, what we found uh, and what is being more aggressively reported in the literature as of the last few years is that adverse effects of the long spine board are coming to surface. And this includes inadequate spinal immobilization, respiratory compromise, and especially when they've been immobilized, when an individual is immobilized on a long spine board for more than 30 minutes, we have pressure sores and reports of discomfort and the onset of signs and symptoms that are very similar to neurological injury. So these adverse effects have led many to call for protocol changes to eliminate the long spine board to uh, immobilize critically injured patients. And that is being generalized to the athletic environment as well. However, there are remaining indications for use of the long spine board. So oftentimes you'll see in the literature these, these protocol changes, these protocol changes uh, for the long spine board, obviously, a lot of times when you read into these spine board protocols or changed protocols, you'll see that there are certain sections of that protocol that are red flagged. Uh, and those red flags are flags that would indicate that the long use of the long spine board is still indicated in certain situations. So many of these new protocols include these red flags that include an axial load or a compression mechanism of injury, midline cervical pain, a bony block, or an obvious deformity. Now it's interesting uh, that these are the same criteria that sports medicine team medical professionals have used historically uh, to indicate the need to transport a potentially spine injured athlete. So the same criteria that we as athletic trainers and sports medicine professionals use to activate EMS to transfer someone to the emergency department is still a red flag for many of these new protocols to continue to use the long spine board 
and immobilize an athlete on the long spine board. Okay. So to help us review some of these alternative protocols, and their, more importantly, their appropriateness in the athletic environment, I have a few guests that I'm going to bring in, and, and hopefully that won't pose uh, a, as much of a challenge to me as just running through some introductory slides here. But um, The first person I'm going to bring in, and uh, Jason, you are now unmuted so we can hear you talk. The first person I'm going to bring in is, is Jason Emmel. Uh, Jason is a paramedic from the state of New Jersey uh, where he is the division administrator at Rutgers University Department of Medicine. That's Daryl. You, you guys all met Daryl earlier. I got to bring him in. My, my slide went a little fast on me. Jason is also uh, tasked with providing emergency medical coverage at MetLife Stadium. Uh, I've had the honor of getting to know Jason and working with Jason over the past six years while working with the Jets and the Giants medical teams during their emergency response training. Um, I know Jason to be a very knowledgeable and experienced paramedic uh, who has likely had more experience caring for critically injured athletes in high profile environments than, than many others. So uh, we'll look for his insight into a multidiscipline sports medicine team to, to greatly add to our discussion. And as I said, he'll be joining us by audio. Uh, today. Jason, are you there? I'm here. <clears throat> I'm here. Excellent. And Daryl, who we've, we've met a couple of times already today. We're, we're going to meet him uh, formally now. Let me find Daryl here. And Daryl will be joining us by webcam, so I'll bring him in. And there is Mr. Conway. Uh, Daryl uh, presently serves as the Senior Associate Athletic Director of Student Athlete Health and Welfare at the University of Michigan, where he oversees athletic medicine, performance science, performance nutrition, performance psychology, Olympic strength and conditioning, performance science and equipment operations, as well as serving as the liaison for team physicians for the University of Michigan Health System and Health Services. Uh, Daryl has also worked full-time as an athletic trainer at the University of Central Florida, University of Northern Iowa, Morgan State University, University of Delaware, and the New York Jets Football Club. So we'll look to Daryl to provide some perspective with respect to big versus small college, uh, as well as, as uh, the professional sports. And so, Daryl, welcome. You are on webcam. Can we hear you? Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon. Right. Thanks, Daryl. All right. And Mr. Bradley Wilson. Brad, I saw you come on. So I... Uh, uh, I, I hope you're there. I knew you, I know you had some last-minute things to do. Um, I'm going to unmute you here. Do we have you here with us today? I'm here. Excellent. All right. Uh, Brad is a nationally registered paramedic who has been involved in EMS since 2001. In 2004, uh, Mr. Wilson became the director of event medical for a small ambulance company uh, where he is tasked with managing the day-to-day -day operations of the medical functions for Reliant Park, uh, which is now our, uh, NRG Park, the Toyota Center, uh, both of which are located in Houston, Texas. He is currently employed by Harris County Emergency Corps as the team medic for the Houston Texans. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with Brad on multiple occasions during a two minutes or less programming with the Texans. And I'll, I'll say this with uh, both uh, respect to the Texans as well as the Giants and the Jets. Um, they are probably the three three most diligently prepared medical teams uh, in the NFL in the professional setting. So uh, we'll look for Brad uh, Brad's input in terms of the perspective of a, a program that really puts a lot of emphasis on emergency response, emergency action planning, annual rehearsal, uh, and a team that puts a lot of thought into the topic that we were discussing, discussing today. Uh, so, Brad, thanks for being able to join us. Thank you for having me. Uh, and now, what I wanted to do um, is, is talk specifically about these alternatives to the long spine board. Uh, and in particular, I want to talk about protocols that use the cervical collar only, where we apply a cervical collar and then aid the athlete um, or aid the patient to uh, to the gurney on his own under his own power. Uh, I also want to look at the scoop stretcher protocol, and, and the reason I 
brought this one up in particular is because when we did our emergency action planning review uh, this year at the high school that I'm at, I was uh, kind of surprised that our EMS crew went to the scoot stretcher protocol. We've traditionally all been long spine board forever. Um, and this year, it, it was kind of a surprise to me that they had moved to the scoop stretcher. So we're going to look at the types of scoop stretchers, techniques, athletic equipment in the scoop stretcher, as well as using that as a transfer device. Uh, and then we're going to look at the long spine, spine board in particular as a, as a transfer device. So the first thing I want to do is look at this issue of using a cervical collar only, um, because I know a lot of athletic trainers express concern over this technique over the summer during our training. Some have suggested that, uh, some of the paramedics actually that we work with would suggest that this is the approach, uh, their, their initial approach, but the pres presence of more significant signs and symptoms may alter that approach or may alter that protocol. So what I'd like to do is, is Jason, start with you. Um, in, in a situation where you are only using a cervical collar, which I know from your perspective is probably not going to be with the Jets or the Giants, but in a situation where you're going with a cervical collar only on a patient, would it change your protocol uh, if you were presented with a patient that had an axial load mechanism of injury, midline cervical pain, and the presence of neurological signs and symptoms? So would, would those signs and symptom patterns automatically change your protocol with respect to use of a cervical collar only? Well, <clears throat> when speaking about uh, using, having this mechanism of injury with an injured athlete, um, we, you know, we wouldn't use just the cervical collar. We would go to the full uh, long board immobilization. Um, just, in, you know, until proven otherwise that it's going to cause some uh, catastrophic uh, detrimental condition to the athlete or the patient, uh, we're going to continue, we would continue to use the same protocols that we've used and that have proven to work successfully. And, um, you know, we're not going to change something uh, unless we're told that it's, you know, it's going to cause some kind of major harm uh, to the patient or the athlete. So, so even in the pre, even outside of MetLife Stadium, just just in general calls in the general population, your area hasn't moved to this just use of a cervical collar. Not as of yet. Uh, New Jersey is uh, unfortunately behind the times uh, in the pre-hospital setting, uh, and there's a lot of discussion about moving towards this, but. Um, as of right now, it has not changed. Um, it, you know, we're still using the long boards. Uh, there's a lot of back and forth between medical directors, EMS providers, and uh, there's still more research that needs to be done. Um, you know, if there's long transport times or, or, or any and other uh, circumstances, then we would uh, possibly, after we get the patient into the back of the ambulance, remove the spine board. Uh, but, you know, as of right now, we're still using the, the, the spine boards. Okay. Brad, would you say that's pretty consistent with you halfway across the country from us? Yeah, I would I would say that's um, fairly consistent. Here in Texas, we are, especially the Houston area, um, we are starting to see a lot of medical directors go to cervical collar only with a scoop stretcher. Um, however, Luckily, it hasn't been recommended for what we would do from day to day here at the stadium with any athletics or anything like that. Um, and it's very, very um, critical that we, you know, get the good patient history and do a good physical exam on the patient before we start doing the cervical collar only. Um, even though it's starting to go that way here, um, we still are very very um, dependent on the long board. Okay, so so let's look then at at cervical collars, um, and and I always think it's interesting that we work with with many teams across across the country, and and in doing so, we've had the opportunity to work with a, a lot of the spine surgeons, a lot of the trauma physicians that. Uh, that are presently doing a lot of research in this area, and it's, it's always interesting to note that I would say without, uh, without exception, 
a lot of the trauma physicians and a lot of the paramedics that we talk to as well will will say something to the effect that never has there been a spine injured patient that has paralyzed themselves. So uh, that that's kind of the rationale for this cervical collar is we have the the negative effects of the long spine board and we comp we, we combine that with the fact that basically if if the individual is not paralyzed but they do have a fracture in the cervical spine that they do a pretty good job of splinting themselves and, and with the aid of a cervical collar they're not likely to paralyze themselves and it, it, that's just an interesting um, observation or comment that I think is has, has been made multiple times uh, in, in kind of the rationale for these cervical collars only but if we look at the different protocols that are being used for the cervical collar we apply a cervical protocol number one is traditionally we apply the cervical collar and in this case with an equipment laden athlete we would have to remove the, the, the equipment from the athlete and we aid the athlete to the gurney and again this would require equipment removal from an equipment laden athlete the second protocol that uh, was fairly commonly talked about over the course of the summer was using an extended seat collar or something along the lines of what's referred to as a Kendrick extrication device. And again, um, this would provide a little bit more support than uh, a traditional cervical collar and would also uh, require equipment removal. So um, those of you um, participating today may have come across this as, as a possible protocol. Um, that's, that you've seen on field. And then finally we have uh, protocol number three which was fairly common um, was using a cervical collar with the long spine board transfer. All right? And this would require on-field equipment removal, uh, would require transfer to the long spine board using either a log roll or a flat lift, and then would require removal of the long spine board. So these are three different approaches to that, that technique. Now the next thing I wanted to get into was was the scoop stretcher uh, and, and talk a little bit about that. We actually went out and made some video of, of the scoop stretcher protocol and, and that can be found on the YouTube channel uh, where we actually do a review of the scoop stretcher technique. Um, and what we found was, uh, there, there are some obvious things that we found. Um, the types of, a, of scoop stretcher uh, made a big difference. Uh, in terms of aluminum versus plastic. But more importantly, when we were doing this, we found that that's what's really important in the scoop stretcher is the rating of that, not only the weight rating, and we found that unless you specifically purchase a scoop stretcher that is rated for more than 500 or, or I think it's 650 pounds, up to 650 pounds, more often than not, if you don't specifically purchase that uh, scoop stretcher, you're gonna get one that's rated for 350 pounds. Um, and we found that problematic just with the 6'3", 290-pound individual that we used to test on this. We found that the scoop stretcher, especially the aluminum scoop stretcher, was uh, stressed, to say the least, under, under that. Not to mention he was 6'3", so with the plastic, plastic scoop stretchers, many of those weren't even big enough out of the box to, to handle a 6'3 individual. So um, when we're dealing with equipment-laden athletes, in particular football, um, that scoop stretcher protocol can present a problem right off the bat if you don't practice this and make sure that your equipment is rated for an oversized athlete. We also found pretty significant maintenance issues um, with the both the scoop stretchers, the aluminum and the plastic, we couldn't get those apart in a very effective manner. So we went back to the maintenance, uh, the instructions for the scoop stretcher and found that there is an actual routine that you're supposed to go through for lubrication and maintenance of the scoop stretchers but the ones that we got were right off the back of a BLS rig and in an emergency it would have been let's say uh, to say the least embarrassing uh, to be struggling with this kind of stuff on the field and, and yet we took this right out of the back of a BLS rig that was on a call earlier in the day and would be on call later in the day so uh, maintenance were, were big issues. Use of a scoop stretcher to transfer the, to the gurney. One thing I want to pose to to the paramedics that are out there, uh, Jason and Brad in particular, um, do one question that came up while we were running through this, two questions actually is, would we immobilize the head and neck before we lifted the scoop stretcher off the ground and put them on the gurney? And 
second of all, once we get them on the gurney, do we remove the scoop stretcher or do we leave it in place on the gurney and transport them that way? What are your protocols suggesting that you do? Well, what we do is if, if we have them on the scoop stretcher, we'll leave them on the scoop stretcher. We'll um, do the C-collar and then get them on the scoop stretcher and then immobilize them down that way and then move them to the stretcher. Once we're on the stretcher and um, they're immobilized on it, we will not remove it. Jason, is that consistent with you? Yes, that's exactly how we would operate as well. So the things we looked at then specifically, we looked at two different techniques for using the scoop stretcher. We used the split scoop technique where we actually split the scoop stretcher uh, at the top and the bottom and slid the blades in from the side. And we use both in aluminum, you see here in these pictures. We use both the, the, um, the, the aluminum and the plastic. Um, and, and I gotta be honest with you, that I, I can't see this working. Uh, and uh, I guess I would pose to you two, Brad and, and Jason, I would pose to you, are, are we doing something, are we not using the scoop stretcher as, as you might uh, with an equipment laden athlete because uh, we had the blades were getting caught on the equipment and here we did it on grass not artificial turf maybe that would be different but I don't I don't think so um, the blades were either getting caught on the the equipment or the blades were getting because he was 290 pounds the blades were driven down into the grass and for the life of us we could not get the the scoop stretcher back together at the head and the neck uh, with the equipment left in place. So is there, now our paramedic that I work with here suggested that when I brought this up, he suggested it'd be nice, easy, gentle rocking back and forth and we, without significant movement at the head and neck, and we'd be able to slide those blades under there. We tried it and I can't see that happening. There, there was a considerable amount of movement at the head and neck, much more than I would, I would say would be referred to as safe handling. Um, and at the end of the day, we still weren't able to get that closed. Um, we then went to a different technique where we tried the V-scoop technique, where we kept the, the base of the scoop stretcher uh, locked in place. And we thought, well, maybe if we use the V-scoop technique. And again, that did not significantly improve outcomes. So is there, are we missing something in, in terms of how to apply the scoop stretcher? Uh, in, in this regard that, that would improve the outcome or improve the use in this particular setting? Jason? Uh, I, I, I don't see it, honestly. I, I, those, those are the same obstacles that, that you know, we would encounter as well um, with the equipment on, the blades getting caught, um, you know, being unable to secure it up at the head and um, just not giving you the support needed to lift, uh, you know, a 300, 350 pound um, uh, athlete. It's just, uh, it just it really isn't feasible. And then on, on the second hand, you know, if we removed all of the equipment on the field, you know, we, we're really not, that's not our protocol. We're not, unless there's a life-threatening emergency that we have to deal with right away, we're not removing equipment out on the field. We're getting the player into the tunnel or into the back of the ambulance and reassessing and then removing equipment. Um, you know, so it's just to use a to use a spine board. It's just um, it's faster, it's more efficient, uh, and it just it, it's safer in in my opinion. Yeah, I have to agree with Jason. I mean, um, you got to look at it too. The scoop stretchers when they were originally thought of and made, they weren't considering 350-pound athletes with full equipment on. So in order for them to work properly, um, you know, they're, well, basically they're not going to work properly with the full equipment. So that's why they are so difficult to use because they're going to get caught on everything. They're going to get, they're not going to give the support that a long spine board is going to give. Well, then, then I, I guess maybe the, the the obvious, uh, the obvious thing that we have to do if we're going to employ this scoop stretcher technique, the obvious thing then is that we have to remove the equipment on field prior to using that scoop stretcher. So, you know, on removing the the equipment on field, Jason, you alluded to this too, is, is that you don't you don't want to do that, and and we're going to get into the rationale for 
um, various equipment removal environments. Um, but if we were to remove the equipment, the, the argument in the literature uh, is that the benefits allow us to use a C collar protocol where if the equipment is left in place, we don't have a, we can't use the C collar with the equipment left in place. Um, if we were to remove it on the field, it, facil it certainly facilitates the scoop stretcher protocol because now this person is no longer an equipment laden athlete and we're more likely to be able to scoop them, uh, reserve for a 350 pound offensive lineman who's still going to be oversized. Um, we need to account for that in the design of the scoop stretcher. If we remove it on field, we have immediate and ongoing access throughout the continuum of care with that equipment out, uh, now off of the athlete. Um, and, and the argument in the literature is that we're the best at doing that. Uh, I, I, t I take issue with that. I'm not sure that we are all by nature of uh, being athletic trainers or paramedics that we're necessarily the best. I think it's like anything else. If you're not well versed at it and well practiced at it, then you're not going to be the best at it. You're not going to be any better than anyone else at, uh, at doing it. So. Some of the drawbacks, uh, Jason, probably what you're alluding to are you lose the ability of that equipment to help you immobilize an athlete, which, you know, when someone is properly packaged in a full set of football equipment, it's hard to immobilize them any better than that. But I, I know, Jason, you're a particular fan of this chaotic environment kind of philosophy. And when you remove, when you get the individual stabilized, get them on a backboard and get them out of the chaotic environment, uh, I know that's a positive. Um, Whereas if we if we remove the, the equipment on field, uh, we have increased time in that chaotic environment where cameras can capture what we're doing, spectators are there to see everything that's going on, and in my setting, uh, in the high school setting, I get lots of what I call help uh, from people that come out of the stands to offer their their expertise, and not to mention the environmental considerations. And, you know, someone that's sweaty and been exercising for an hour and a half at full capacity and all of a sudden you know they're injured and it's raining out and it's cold it's November uh, do you really want to strip them of their equipment get them cold and then put them back in, the, in a warm ambulance that, that doesn't seem uh, like a reasonable option to, in, in every case um, so then I, I think uh, using the long spine board as a transfer device is another comment um, that has been made consistently over the course of, of the summer, this past summer. So we use the spine board to transfer that individual to a gurney, and then we remove the spine board once they're on the gurney. All right, so uh, my question to you guys then is, does removal of the long spine board after they're transferred to the gurney really benefit the patient? it seems that the amount of movement and effort associated with long spine board removal is potentially worse than leaving them on the spine board. So, you know, we went through, we did a flat lift technique to remove it on the gurney, from the gurney, and then we used a log roll push maneuver to get them, to get the spine board out from underneath the athlete once he was on there. And, you know, the long roll, the log roll push certainly worked but again it's another movement of the athlete and does that does that is that really warranted are the, the adverse effects of the long spine board really warrant do they really warrant that type of additional movement of the athlete Brad what, what would you say to that um, no I don't think so I think once they're on the spine board unless we're gonna have um, you know the physician actually in the ambulance with us to do a, a spinal clearance um, we're not going to remove them from that spine board because we don't, just like you say, we don't want to do any type of um, additional movement to that athlete as, as we need to. All right. Then let's look at uh, long spine board transfer protocols then. Uh, how, how we might use the long spine board to transfer somebody. So we can remove all the equipment from the athlete, apply a seat collar, transfer the athlete to a long spine board, and we can use a flat lift technique uh, if we have enough people to do that, or we can use a log roll push uh, technique, and then we, we then use the spine board to transfer them to the gurney. We can then remove the long spine board with a flat lift or the log roll and then secure them to the gurney. So that, that's one option. 
And here you'll see uh, what we did is, is we actually went through those two various protocols um, where we left the equipment in place and, and did this transfer. And then we removed the board using the flat lift um, and the log roll push. And both of those, certainly I can see those both working, the, the flat lift if you have enough people and you're practiced at doing it. Here we did it without the proper number of people in the top image there and we did that on purpose because most of us don't have that many people uh, that are going to be able to help us with a, a flat lift. Um, and then we did the log roll push which you can do with with less people than the flat lift. And then we removed the equipment uh, and we thought the benefit there was that you're now you're removing the equipment from the long with the long spine board underneath them and it's a flat smooth surface. So that actually made equipment removal easier than if we did it while we were on the field. Uh, and then we removed the long spine board. And again, the, the other thing that was nice with the equipment removal was the ergonomics. Now you're up, you're on a gurney, so now the athlete is at your level. You're not down on your hands and knees on the turf trying to remove the equipment. It's a much more ergonomically correct position, and we found that to be um, significantly easier to do. And here you'll see equipment from removal from the long spine board was, uh, I would say it was easier uh, than if we did it on the field. Certainly wasn't challenged by the fact that the long spine board was underneath them. Um, so there, there weren't any issues there. Now our focus um, today is on non-life-threatening. If it was a life-threatening situation, all of what we're talking about changes, obviously, because now we're in a situation where we're we're forced to deal with what is being presented to us in, in terms of an emergency. So we would, however, these these uh, techniques for transferring some would certainly stay uh, generalized after the athlete's been stabilized. So we get the athlete. On the spine, uh, on the spine board, we get the athlete on the gurney, and we get them out of the um, out of the chaotic environment. Okay, so what do we mean by out of the chaotic environment? Now, a lot of times, uh, you know, Brad and Jason, we talk about getting them off the field and, and getting them into the tunnel, where where we we're out from under prying eyes, we're out from underneath the cameras, but. Um, Daryl, I'm going to bring you in. You had mentioned in a, in a previous discussion that we had that not all colleges have a tunnel. Uh, so using using a tunnel as an escape route, if you will, isn't an option for, for some of the colleges that even the University of Michigan plays. I can't remember um, if, if you guys have a tunnel or not that you can escape to. Um, but, but talk a little bit about in, in your environment about getting somebody out of that chaotic environment because there's a lot of a lot of similarities to the professional sports but a lot of differences as well yeah well again it all depends on what size school you're talking about there are several division one schools that don't have a tunnel that you go right from the field right off onto the road um, where they may be transported to so in that case um, they're going right into the back of the ambulance and I think it's a, a good uh, time to consider, you know, there's no such thing as always and never, that every situation is different and making sure that you're practicing uh, for your situation. And if you're on the road, taking the time to have that time out to talk with the home team about what's going to be done. Um, but yeah, every every Division One school doesn't have a tunnel, let alone as you get down into Division Two, II, Division Three, and high school, probably very few of those schools actually have a, a enclosed tunnel where you're away from cameras, you're away from people. Well, when we use when we use the term tunnel, then we should probably talk more specifically about just basically getting out of the field environment, getting into a more controllable environment where you can take your time, you don't have to worry about other people watching what you're doing, uh, and, and you can make decisions in, in a more controlled uh if, if I dare say, less stressful environment. Correct. So, so even though you may not have a tunnel, the, the tunnel is just representing that protected environment, if you will. And, 
and Daryl, you had mentioned that 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 may actually, in, in some cases, that may mean going directly to the rig. Yeah, uh, and that being going directly to the rig, going back into the athletic training room. Um, if your doctor's office is right there, going into the doctor's office, but just somewhere out of uh, the chaotic environment where TV cameras would be or cell phones or uh, et cetera, mainly a controlled environment where you're controlling who's there and what's being able to be released. Right. And I, and I would agree 100% with that. Even in, in my case, I certainly don't have a tunnel at, at the stadium where, where our kids play. Uh, and anytime we do any of this kind of stuff, they go right into the back of the rig. And, and even though, even though there are drawbacks to doing things in the rig, um, it's still better than having people come down and try and tell us the right thing, the right way to do things. And, and certainly to get them out of, if it's raining, if it's cold, certainly to get them into that controlled environment, which is the, you know, in our, in my case would be the ambulance. So you know, again, whether it's in the professional setting where you can get them into the tunnel, uh, take care of them there, uh, or if you don't have that luxury, making plans to get them into a safer environment, and that may that may include the ambulance. Um, you know, some of the drawbacks would be it, it's tough to remove the long spine board uh, in an ambulance. Uh, it, less than less than beneficial ergonomics, I would say. Here we're removing equipment from an athlete that we put in the back of an ambulance simulator. And, you know, although there was certainly a reduced workspace, I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't say that it posed a significant problem for us. And uh, one of the comments with the students we were working with, though, uh, and Jason, maybe you can highlight this a little bit, is uh, a lot of a lot of these ambulances are going from you know old school ambulances that had a big box on the back and, and had a little bit more workable room to these they're actually vans, um, which which have significantly less working space in them. So, uh, I don't, what is your thought about removing equipment and dealing with this in the back of an ambulance? Is it is, is it an issue for you as a paramedic? Well, um, game day, it's not really an issue because we do have uh, an oversized uh, box ambulance. We do not uh, use a van uh, at the stadium uh, for that specific reason. If it, you know, I have worked in the past in vans and, um, you know, you, you can have difficulty, you know, if there's the patient and, you know, you have three or four crew members in the back of that van, you know, that, that even on a patient without equipment and an oversized patient, you're going to have difficulty. So, um, again, you know, it, it, that could definitely pose difficulty. So, um, you know, if, if, it's, if you don't need to remove the equipment in the back of the ambulance, you know, and you can, you're close to the hospital and, and the athlete's secured and uh, immobilized and, you know, everything is going as is, as the way it should be, which doesn't always happen, you know, I would say, you know, get them to the, set, the second controlled environment, which is actually the hospital. The first is the back of your ambulance, you're getting them off the field, you're bringing them into the ambulance, so that's controlled. But then the next level is, you know, in the emergency room where you have multiple hands for help, you have a lot of space and a lot of room. You know, we want to we want to eliminate unnecessary movement, um, unnecessary discomfort to the athlete. You know, we just want to get them to the hospital in, as quickly as possible and uh, as comfortably as possibly as possible. Right. And then, and once they're in that emergency department, now you work and and, and uh, Brad, I know it's the same for you. Um, and, and I would suspect, uh, Daryl, for the University of Mich Michigan, it's probably the same, where you, you have enough experienced staff members where you can send somebody in the back of the ambulance, or you're, I mean, you either have a paramedic that's in the back of the ambulance that is well-versed in all this, you're sending an athletic trainer that is well-versed in it, or the trauma physician is in the back, and, and you guys all practice enough that everyone in that continuum could do any of that, any of those procedures at any given time in that, along that transport route. Uh, and then, so so that, you know, therefore you can take the time and say, all right, let's 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 just wait, because when we get to the emergency room, all of those assets are available to you too. And now you have experienced people that are in the emergency room um, that can help with those, those removal procedures. That's not necessarily the case for the overwhelming majority of us. And I think, Daryl, you put it, you put it spot on when you say you work in Disney World. 
Yeah, uh, professional yeah. sports high level college is Disney World compared yeah. to a high school or a lower level college. Yeah, and and I think that's a, a, a very important point to make. That as we're talking about all of this kind of stuff, you have to remember that I don't work in Disney World. So when I, when I send someone to the emergency room, I have to stay and cover the rest of the game. Uh, I know that my paramedics know how to do all this because we train very specifically in doing that. But for others that are out there that don't have that opportunity, um, there's, there's decisions that need to be made based on that information. Um, you know, if, if there's not a consistent level of care across the continuum to the emergency department or the receiving facility, those are going to weigh into your decision about when equipment gets removed. So let's, let's look then at some of the current trends. Uh, if, and again, if these are observational and, and just an expert opinion uh, across the last couple of months. If we look at, and, and you guys weigh in at any time on this if, if you think uh, if you think there's something different uh, in these trends, but this is what I was seeing uh, as of this summer. If you look at professional and big colleges, they're going to leave the equipment on. They might remove the face mask and they may prep the shoulder pads. That was kind of an individual team by team thing. Some did, some didn't. Um, but that was because they have extensive training throughout the entire continuum of care. So any one person, as I said, any one person could do any of those techniques at any given time up to uh, the receiving facility. For the most part, those uh, th that environment, uh, that practice setting, they're going to leave them on the spine board. They'll transfer by long spine board, leave them on the spine board, uh, because and, and generally speaking, because there's less immobilization time. You guys don't have to worry about uh, those long immobilization times because oftentimes you have a police escort to the emergency room, so um, you know th those aren't issues for you. In the high school and smaller college setting, though, where they rely on regional EMS uh, pre-hospital protocols that are, are generalized to athletics. So a perfect example is my setting here, whereas they change the protocol using a scoop stretcher. So it, they make no differentiation between uh, someone that was hurt at Walmart and someone that, and an equipment-laden athlete that is hurt Friday night on our field. So they generalize those protocols, and I think that's very consistent a very consistent criticism or concern, I should say, that a lot of athletic trainers in the high school and smaller college setting uh, were reporting over the summer. Um, so it, I, I think those are pretty consistent. I mean, would you would you all agree with that? That those are pretty consistent trends. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Uh, now, if you look at uh, again to to reiterate some of this, we'll, you know, here we have. Uh, some training that we were doing with the New York Jets. This was a few years ago, but look, look at the look at the assets that are running to the injury scene. So I don't have this on Friday night, so I don't get to send someone in the in, in the back of the ambulance. There, there's not a whole lot of training throughout the continuum, and I certainly don't have a police escort to get my athlete to Strong Memorial Hospital, which on a good day is 25 minutes away. Um, you know, so if my transport time is greater than 30 minutes, maybe that weighs into the decision about whether I re put them on a spine board to begin with, uh, although I still am a proponent of the spine board, but maybe it weighs into my decision about whether we leave the spine after we get them on the gurney, maybe that weighs into my decision about whether to take the spine board out or not. I don't know. We'll, we'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, and again, you know, high school and small colleges, uh, that's the case. You're oftentimes looking at immobilization times that are longer than 30 minutes, and that's where those adverse signs and symptoms or adverse effects of long-term immobilization start to play in the, in the effect. What do physicians say about this? Well, it, that's pretty interesting. For the most part, all the physicians that we talk to across the board, neurosurgeons, trauma docs, all they really care about is safe handling. They don't care per se, if you log roll somebody, if you flat lift them, uh, they don't particularly care if you scoop stretcher, um, they don't care if you use a seat collar, they don't, it, all, they, all they are primarily concerned about is that you have a safe handling protocol in place and that it's rehearsed and everybody is very good at it and everybody knows the protocol that's going to take effect um, in the event that it has to. Their biggest concern is safe handling in the pre-hospital environment 
and time to decompression. So I think Jason, I think you had mentioned you just you want to get them packaged up as quick and get them to the hospital as quickly as, as possible. And I think that's over, overwhelmingly what the physicians want as well. Don't do any don't don't do any harm in the pre-hospital environment, and let's get them to surgery. Um, and and that's probably the the biggest factor in all of this. EMS directors regionally are 50-50. Uh, some of them are telling you, I don't want any more spine boards on the on the ambulances. Uh, others have a have no real preference and leave it up to the paramedics to decide what is the most appropriate in, in the safe handling decision making. All right, so before we go, let's leave with one final thought. And, and I, want, uh, I want to leave opportunity for everybody to type in any questions they have so we can pose this to our, to our panel. Um, if we think rationally about all that we've discussed so far, it seems that the long spine board should remain uh, an integral part of the pre-hospital care environment in, in athletics, especially in particular management of the equipment-laden athlete. So let's bring back this earlier slide of cervical collars. And during this part of the discussion, it was suggested that a battery of more significant signs and symptoms would prompt many uh, to use the long spine board instead of just going with the C collar. So if you allow me for just a minute, let me make an argument uh, for actually very little change in terms of long spine boarding protocols in the athletic environment. Okay, so, and you guys can chime in at any, at any point, and I'm, I'm hoping that you will. Um, because as I was going through getting ready for this for this presentation, it, it just struck me how the more you consider what we actually, the more you try and apply these new protocols to the athletic environment, and when you actually go out onto the field and try them, there's a lot of holes. Uh, and I certainly see how they apply to you know standard EMS in the general population, but um, they really present a problem for us on a number of fronts. So. Let's uh, assume for the sake of this argument that we're dealing with a stable, non-life-threatening situation. All right. So what do you think of this? We use a log roll push to get the athlete to the long spine board because many of the observations I made over the summer during programs suggest that the log roll push was more effective than a simple uh, a log roll maneuver. And, and we'll do that to, to transfer from prone to supine and then also to put them on the, on the spine board. And we found that particularly useful with hockey goalies. We could use a flat lift if there were enough people on the team and they were well versed at that technique. But generally I think most are more comfortable with a, with a log roll. All right, so now that the athlete is on the long spine board, we can employ to get them out of a chaotic environment. So what I'm trying to do here is go systematically through and get all of the benefits of everything we talked about and leave all the negative consequences out in these different protocols that we've talked about. So now we get them out of the chaotic environment. And in phase two of this, we're out of the chaotic environment, be it the tunnel, be it the back of the ambulance, or what have you. Um, the environment, now, now we can satisfy those who argue for pre-hospital care uh, equipment removal. We don't have to do that on the field. Let's get them out of the chaotic environment but we can still do it pre-hospital before they get to the receiving facility. But now, they're, now we're doing that off the long spine board, which is a smoother surface. Uh, we can put the C collar on, uh, and, and we can do that at a better ergonomic position. So generally, if we group that all into safe handling, uh, that, that seems like it's gonna produce a lot less movement because we're all at a better ergonomic position in a much calmer environment to do all of that in. All right, now, we can leave them on the long spine board to facilitate transfer in the emergency room. And I, here's where I think I'm a big proponent of leaving the spine board in place. And Jason, you and I talked about this a little bit too. You have a 350 pound offensive lineman. Do you really want to use a sheet to transfer him from your ambulance gurney to the emergency room gurney? Would you want to do that? That, that, that that's, that's almost impossible to do. Uh, right. it, it, it not only puts the, the injured athlete in risk of further injury by maybe dropping them, the sheet breaking, or it could, you know, the, the people that are doing the moving uh, as well. It's just really not, a, it's not a smart practice. Now, some would argue that we could use a flat lift or a six-person lift to get them over. Now, uh, um, 
Brad, I mean, what are your thoughts? Would you would you want to do a sheet transfer, a, a, a six-person lift, or would you rather use the, the long spine board? Or do you have other thoughts on that? I would use rather use the long spine board because, you know, just like Jason said, you don't know how, how the sheet's going to go. You don't know if you have the manpower to move a sheet, an athlete on the sheet. Same with the flat lift. You don't know if you're going to have the right personnel with you that's going to be able to lift that 350-pound lineman um, to get them safely moved over to the to the gurney. So, you know, it's the safest for the um, the pre-hospital providers, the safest for the nurses, the doctors, and the athlete is just, you know, using the flat or the long spine board where you can just slide them over. Daryl, would you say this discussion, this the, these three phases that were outlined here, would you say they're consistent with what you do at the University of Michigan? Uh, yeah, I think for the most part they're consistent. We do train in a stressful environment to take the equipment off, So, but we use, utilize based on the uh, actual scenario that's going to present itself, you know. Right. You know, right now in November, are we going to take the equipment off on the field? Probably not um, because it's going to be 30, 40 degrees out for sweaty athlete. Um you know, we'll get them up to the tunnel, up to the uh, up to the rig, and take it off there where we have heat and we're ready to go. You know, in September, um, it just depends on the situation. But either way, um, whether or not we're using a long spine board or using a combi carrier um, scoop stretcher, they'll generally stay on the uh, backboard until we get to the hospital. Again, we're at Disney World. We're two minutes away from our hospital at home and no matter where we play we're probably less than five minutes um, right. from the hospital and we know that any athlete whether it be a practice situation or game situation we're one phone call from having the trauma surgeon and a neurosurgeon meeting us at the front doors to the hospital so we aren't worried about the extended uh, backboard times okay so for me I am I am worried about the extended immobilization time all right, all right? That, that is a concern for me. So then I, I guess, and, and for those of us out there that are in my, in my boat, um, do, do, the, the, do the potential adverse effects of, of the long spine board, the inadequate immobilization, which I'm, I'm not sure I'm sold on that, but <clears throat> um, the, the potential airway complications, not having access to the, to, to the athlete to provide critical care during transport, um, the increased neurological signs and symptoms and discomfort associated with immobilization long term, do those outweigh uh, the benefit of being left on the spine board for, uh, to, to be able to more safely transfer them in the emergency room? So in, in other words, if I know that my athlete's going to be on that board more than 30 minutes and I know some of these signs and symptoms are likely to, to result, do those outweigh the benefit of, of much safer handling once they get to the emergency room. You know, I don't think they outweigh. Again, I think you take every situation, you know, absolutely critical patient, you know, are you going to waste time to remove the spine board on an absolutely critical patient? Hopefully not. You're just going to load and go. Um, I would even argue with, with people that even in, in a non-critical patient, do you want to waste the time to try to remove the spine board in a compromised, um, restricted space such as an ambulance. Whether or not you're in a big box or a van, you still don't have the same space as if you do on a 50-yard line. So to me, I'd rather wait and get to the hospital with them on the spine board. A, you have more space, you have more people, you're in a controlled environment, and uh, it, it aids you from on that side. Jason? I agree. Uh, you know, like, I, I, I'm, it's so nice to hear Daryl say that, you know, every situation is different and, you know, never say always, or I forgot your exact quote, Daryl, but it's very true. We take every, every case differently. Um, but, you know, if, if it calls for it, we do what we, we have to remove the equipment on the field. If, you know, if it's life threatening, if not, you know, we get them in the ambulance and then that the hospital is the best place to do that. Um, there's plenty of hands. It's, it's controlled and 
um, it's just it's just the, the best practice in, in our opinion over with the Giants and the Jets and both teams are on board with it. The doctors, the, the training staff, everyone's on board with it. Brad? Yeah, I have to agree with um, everything Daryl and Jason said. Um, it's just, if you, unless you need to get it off on the field, um, just leave them on the long spine board in the equipment. Um, and just protect them as much as you can and let's just do it in the emergency room where we have room we have personnel we have everything we need right there so so if we could draw some conclusions here first of all uh, all of our comments the entire discussion flies in the face of all of the trends uh, all of the research that's going on out there Um, it's flying in the face and it seems like there's a little bit of a dis- dis- disparity or discrepancy between what is being shown in the literature and what actually works on the field. So, I, you know, I mean, our, our comments here are bucking the trend, um, I would venture to say. Um, but it seems to be a very rational reason for, for leaving the long spine board in play uh, in athletics. And, and I, but I also think that I think what this debate is highlighting is this this idea of safe handling and making decisions based on what is being presented at the time, rather than trying to come up with a protocol that applies in every situation. And maybe we can call that the red kid approach. Whereas we have scoop stretcher, we have long spine board, we have flat lift, we have torso lift technique, flat torso technique. We have all these equipment, these techniques available to us. And it's our, it, it, what we bring to the table is the cognitive ability to decide which one of those is most appropriate at any given time based on what is presented on the field. So I, I, I think we can draw those conclusions out of the discussion for today and, and hopefully give everybody uh, that was on the other end listening uh, some, some things to, to take back to their setting. And, and conduct very thorough annual rehearsal and, and make these decisions based on their own clinical setting. What stuff does BLS bring? Uh, what stuff will ALS have when they show up? How far is your transport receiving facility from your field? Do you have a, 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 a less chaotic environment that you can get somebody off the field or do you not? Uh, or can you make arrangements for those types of things? And those are only things that you can come up with if you get together and practice this with your medical team. And I think as, as challenging as that can be for a lot of athletic trainers in the high school setting, I, that's just, uh, like, like I say in the class all the time, uh, that might be very, very hard. It might be very, very challenging, but it's also that's part of our job. So sorry about that, but you, you have to get it done. Um, so with that, what I want to do is I, I know we went over by about seven minutes and that's probably how long it took me to figure out how to get the webinar to show them the right screen. So I apologize for that. Um, but what I want to do is, is anybody that has to leave, I know, I, I understand, I understand everybody has a busy schedule. Um, but for anyone that wants to stay on and interact a little bit, um, if you, if you want to take a minute to chat. Uh, type in any questions or comments that you might have, and, and I'll keep the panel here as long as they can um, to, to discuss anything that might come up. Those of you that type in comments that we don't get to, I'll certainly make those, uh, I'll pose those questions to the panelists in emails, and emails, and I'll make sure that we get um, those, type, those, those questions answered as well. So <clears throat> while you guys are thinking about anything to type in, I'll, I'll say, uh, to Jason, to Brad, and to Daryl, thank you very much. Uh, I, I know everybody is extremely busy, and to take an hour out of the middle of the day like this, um, I, I appreciate that very much. So I appreciate you taking part in this and for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, so what we'll do Thanks, is Michael. You, yeah, absolutely. So if you guys can hang out just for a minute, let, let me give two or three minutes just to see if anybody types anything in. Sometimes uh, things don't get typed in until a little bit after we close out. I'll email you those questions that come in, but you can hang out just for maybe a couple of minutes um, and we'll see if anybody types anything in.
looks like everybody's doing exactly what I would do. Log out and go to lunch. <laughs> Okay. Oh, here we go. Uh, we have one here that just came in. The NATA now seems to recommend equipment removal before transport for, of the equipment uh, or for the equipment athlete. After this presentation, I'm inclined to leave the equipment on. Uh, Daryl, what do you think about that? I think it's again, it's a it's an individualized approach. I think you have to um, take into account your situation. You know, we will here at the University of Michigan remove equipment before we transport. Whether or not it's on the field or whether or not it's on the rig, we're just big believers in doing the same thing no matter what. Whether or not it's a uh, a stable patient or unstable patient, because they can go unstable at any, at any time. But you know, we live in Disney World. We always have the personnel. We always have. Um, the, the people to do it and we train to that yeah. uh, level in a stressful situation in all different weather conditions. You know, that's the one thing I would say is when you talk about an annual rehearsal, your annual rehearsal is not just on August 1st of every single year. Your annual rehearsal is there's a big difference between when it's 85, 90 degrees outside and not raining versus in the middle of November when it's 30 degrees and snowing out. Have you trained in that situation? and the majority of athletic trainers train on August 1st and never, you know, put your spine board away unless you have to use it. Um, that's, you know, a, a area that you need to rehearse and, uh, and stressful practice. Don't, you know, we train to 40 seconds, you know, from the time we start to the time we're done, there is 40 seconds to have equipment off and cervical collar on. So that's something that uh, the level that we train to. And I, I think an important part of that NATA uh, document, too, is, is that they talk about, they don't necessarily say on-field equipment removal. They, they talk about pre-hospital care. Or Correct. They, they talk about pre-hospital removal. So we can get them off the field and into that safe zone, if you will, be it the, the tunnel or the rig, and that's still pre-hospital. So we, we can get them out of the chaotic environment with their equipment on, get them into the tunnel, get them into the rig, and then we can make those decisions about whether it's, it's more appropriate to remove it in the rig and get them or, or just to take them as is. So I, I think that's an important part of that NATA position statement is that they, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, but they talk more about pre-hospital removal, not necessarily on-field removal. Correct. They talk about pre-hospital removal. They don't specifically say it has to be on the field. And again, um, take every situation individualized and get them to the best place for that removal with the best people. Yeah, because my my inclination at my school is I'm going to put them on a spine board, get them into the back of the ambulance. Then we're going to take the equipment off in the ambulance and send them to the emergency room. Um, whereas if Jason, if I was working with you, or Brad, if I was working with you, I, I know that we wouldn't do that. You know, the face mask would be removed, and more off, more light. I, and again, I know there are various conditions, but for the most part, nine out of ten stable athletes are going to have their face mask removed, and off they go. Um, so, you know, the, the, but those are decisions you make on the fly. Those aren't those aren't decisions that are dictated to you that you have to do that. Um, and, and those are all based on, you know, you guys have the assets to, to deal with that stuff at any point along the continuum. Uh, I don't. I don't have that. So that, that's a big difference. Well, Michael, if I can, one thing that um, we have the advantage of, and I'm, I'm sure Jason has the same advantage as well, being with the Jets and the Giants, but we actually are starting to look at where if it's a, if it's a patient that starts to turn critical, we'll still actually leave the equipment on to where we have the chest open once the laces on the shoulder pads are cut and the straps are cut. We still have access to the chest at that point. So if we need to out of all of a sudden start innovating, we have the video laryngoscopes available. Um, we have Lucas devices available to help us aid in con compressions. So as far as we're concerned as a service and with the Texans, we're really moving towards 
we're not going to touch the equipment unless, you know, it's a last ditch effort that we have to do it until we get to the hospital. So, I've, you know, I, I've read the NATA statement and I agree with it, but I also disagree with it. So, you know, I think it, as a guidance tool, it's just something that we as a group of um, medical professionals need to sit down and discuss just like we're doing right now. Absolutely. And uh, I, I will, uh, I couldn't have said that better myself. That's exactly uh, the thought process and our protocol that we have with the Jets and the Giants. Uh, we we do expose the chest if you know if we need to use the uh, the defibrillation or to intubate, uh, but you know we're going to leave everything on unless absolutely something you know happens that we have to take it off. Uh, we've we've done both I'll, I'll say, and um, it's just it, uh, my experience. It's just been more controlled and more efficient and just a, a, a smoother run uh, situation when we've left all the equipment on. When we went to take off, um, it just seems like there were too many people involved. Uh, it just became more chaotic uh, trying to get all that equipment off in the back of the ambulance even. So um, we're going to, uh, it's nice to hear that we're on the same page as the Houston Texans. Very good. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm going to let everybody off the hook. Uh, if any other questions come in, um, I'll, I'll pose those to you and give you a chance to, to respond to those, and then I'll send that back out to the participants. But uh, other than that, I will bid everybody a, a fair adieu, and, and hopefully we can get together and have another discussion here in, in, the, in the near future. But again, thank you very much for your time, taking time out of your busy day to do this, um, and, and I look forward to working with you all in the future. Thanks, and have